learned uh, several different methods, strategies, uh, several different uh, um, approaches that are successful in this country, we have abandoned the unsuccessful. <laughs> so what we, what we have challenged um, our congregations to do is to re-envision door knocking and to, instead of using the approach from the 1950s and 60s where you take a gospel meeting flyer that was literally produced on a mimeograph copy machine and you go door to, door to a gospel meeting, which is a, it really doesn't work in today's culture. You, you get almost no one attending. It discourages the workers. The church uh, looks at door knocking as a failure, and evangelism doesn't work in America. So that model has been used over and over again, and uh, it's just been beaten to death. So we abandoned that. What we did is we, we, we provided you a different strategy every day to door knock, and what we have found is incredible results. Uh, 30, 35 percent of the doors that we knock, not only do they talk to us, but they become a contact. And we set the bar at the contact level. If you remember, instead of setting the bar at the baptism level, which is not even the level of the New Testament, because Jesus did not go to baptize, he went to teach. Baptism is the result of teaching. So that when you go to the door, your purpose is to make contact so you can teach. So if you get a contact card, you find someone that says, yeah, I'd like to know more about your congregation, and you can return, or if you find someone that says, yes, we, I could use some help at home, I could use a, 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 a mailbox repaired, which in fact Austin and Jeff are repairing right now, what you find is success. So 35% of the people that we, we engaged in this community said, yes, we want you to come back. We want to know more about the, the church. Well, you know, when you're doing foreign mission work, and you're going, to, you know, going into a community, 35% isn't failure. Especially 35% in the United States is not failure. I mean, we're going to leave hundreds of contacts for this congregation to engage um, with the gospel. And so these are individuals that, that, again, ask us to come back. We have their name. We have their address. They wanted to get house to house, heart to heart. They wanted to get some benevolent help. They wanted to know more about the church. Um, so this is, in any definition of the word, extreme success. So we're not going to allow the stereotypes of, uh, you know, evangelism doesn't work in America, or, um, you know, we're too materialistic in this country, or, you know, our culture just doesn't work. We, 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 be better spent if we just go, you know, somewhere else. That's, that's finished. So one message we want to give to the churches of Christ in this country and our brethren is, let's not use those stereotypes to keep the church from doing her job in this country because Satan just laughs as church members sit in the pews uh, apathetic because they don't believe it works. What we have to do is teach our members and get our elders and our preachers engaged and let's get into the community. Um, just waiting for people to come to the building is not a strategy for success. Hoping they click on your website is not a strategy for success, although I, I think a good website's important. We've got to go to them. And when we do, we create an incredible um, stack of contacts. Now, you know, you missions. One of the one of the dilemmas we've always faced is, you know, that local preacher, when we leave, is left with a stack of cards like this, and it, you know, are they ever going to get to your contact? Are they ever going to follow up with your contact? Because you know, there's one preacher, a few members, and they got hundreds of contact cards. Well, brethren, we're about to experience in this country what they feel like. Because now we're on the other side of the coin. Now we're the ones left with all these contacts. So here at Oak Hill, Michael Ferris and Matt Wallen and, and Ron Vick and, and the various other elders and members, they're left with the stack of contacts. Now we're going to find out how it feels to have all these contacts for the fields are widened to harvest, the laborers are few, even in our country. The laborers are few. And so we have got to energize and train our church members because or help if we're going to follow up with all the good contacts we've made. So once again, we're grateful you're here this afternoon. Uh, a few of our workers have had to depart. Some have come in. It's good to see Rick Lawson with us, and, uh, and we have others that have joined us. And uh, uh, Rick is a preacher in Adairsville. That congregation helped support this effort. We did the training seminar at Adairsville right before COVID, and uh, COVID hit them pretty hard. 
And um, right, right during COVID, COVID hit them really hard, but they have come back with vengeance. I mean, they are on fire. They're on the offense and uh, they're doing some great things. They just did an evangelistic VBS. One of the things we teach in our school is, is no more, no more VBSs that are not connected to evangelism. If you're going to do a VBS, we're going to make it evangelistic. We're going to get contacts. We're going to engage the, the, the visitors. What event all year long produces more non-Christian? Christians at your church building than VBS. Tell me what it is. I don't know what it is. So it's an incredible opportunity. You want to hear more about what Adairsville did, just go talk to Rick Lofton. He'll be glad to share with you the successes they've had. So, so there's a lot of good going on. There are so many, uh, so many, there are so many um, tools at our disposal right now in this, in this time of history in the church. We've never had better production, publications, tracks, tools, books. So we are ready to move forward. The Church of Christ in America is going to wake up or, or we're not going to survive. So it's one of the two. So uh, this, this week show, shows us a lot of hope. Uh, brethren, um, I want to make mention of just a couple of things. First, on the, on the table out here where all the compassion cards are located, that's a big part of our school, is teaching churches how to properly use cards to get to get prospect contacts and, and to do Bible studies. It's, it, it's, it, it's not an at-large mission. Please understand, just because you send a few cards out doesn't mean it's going to work. It's a strategic mission. It's got to be set up properly to work. You can't just send one card out with 20 signatures. That's not going to work. You can't have two or three ladies on a Monday sending cards. That's not going to work. All right. It's a strategically laid out mission. We teach it at the school. Here's why this card right here will give you access to the website. So if you'll pick that up on the card table out there, uh, there are 60 different cards. We'll, we'll probably have 20 more by the end of the year, maybe the beginning of next year. They're different designs. We have get well, sympathy, uh, welcome back for visitors, you know, welcome to the community for new movers. We have uh, invitations for people to come. Uh, praying for you, thinking about you. So this is, this is important. Now, when a congregation enrolls in the school, you get a discount on the cards. So that's another incentive to enroll in the school. And so, but the cards are, even if you have no discount, $4 for, for 10 cards, I promise you Hobby Lobby will not beat that price. And, uh, and in fact, you won't throw any of these away. They're all scriptural cards. And so I want you to take a look at that, get that card. It's got the website on it for your home church. Now, the door knocking edition, let's talk about this tool. These are 17 cents a piece. That's an eight page color magazine for 17 cents. I guess you understand that Time Magazine's been ripping you off for a long time, right? 17 cents, it's, 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 it's a no brainer. This is designed for door knocking. I, mean, I hope you took some time and read through it. For $84, you get 500 of these. We will customize it to your congregation. For $15, we mail them to you. So for $100, you got 500 of these to go door knocking. So on October the 2nd, or any day of the year, you can door knock. There's no reason why the church should not be using these. So these are customized to your congregation. This is a brand new tool. This is, this is something we've never done before. This is a special edition any time during the year just for door knocking. So if you're an elder, you're a preacher, you're a church member, make sure you write this information down and get this to your local church. 17 cents a copy, minimum is 500, that's $84, about $15 to ship it to you, $100, you get 500 of these. So that's a, again, a, a tool you can use to reach out. So those are some things I wanted to mention before we begin. Part of, this, part of this AMC is not only practicing, it's learning. And so I'm learning. And you've come up to me with some, some great ideas. We're going to take those ideas and run with it. We're going to put them into practice. When I find something that works, listen, it goes right into the school. Now, I don't put theories in the school. I put practices in the school. So we're about, all, we're about getting things done. Um, we're going to go ahead and begin this evening by looking at Believe the Bible. This is a new tool. It's been out just over a year. I want to tell you how it came into development. So about 10 years ago, I, I, was, uh, I was at, well, was about 15 years ago, I was at Hillsborough Church of Christ, and um, I was going to have a Bible study with non-believers. They did not believe in God. And um, I thought to myself, um, I don't have uh, any materials for non-believers. So I, I went to Apologetics Press, and of course they've got great books, right? They've got 
Discovery Magazine. They've got uh, you know, Reason and Revelation. They, they, they have, uh, I mean, all sorts of, they've got correspondence courses. I could not find a Bible study. I, I don't want to give them a book. Uh, you're talking, a, a book is not the best way to convert people. I don't want to give them a correspondence course, single digit success. I want a Bible study. So I put together a Bible study. Now, I've been working on it for 15 years. So, so several years ago, I went to Bart Warren. Bart Warren is the grandson of Thomas B. Warren, who is the great debater. He debated Anthony Flew um, right outside uh, Fort Worth, Texas, Denton, Texas. It was publicized all over the country. This is when, this is when um, I mean, literally the entire atheistic community was embarrassed. I mean, he was just blown away in that debate. Brother Moore took him to task. If you're, if you're a student in one of your schools of preaching, I don't know if Memphis did this or not, we had to watch that debate. It was required. You know, we had to sit down at Southwest, we watched the debate, we had to dissect it, because I mean, it is, it is an incredible uh, a moment in the history of this country where atheism was just laid flat on its back. So, so his grandson is, is taking the Warren Apologetic Center. So I wanted to go to somebody and I want to say, listen, I want you to test this. I want you to poke holes in it. I want you to tell me if this will work, but we got to put it down where the calves can get it. We got to make it simple. So they, they, they took the materials and we began, you know, honing it and developing it further. And, and, and then, I, then I took it to schools of preaching. I took it to Memphis, Brown Trail South. I said, hey, can you teach it to your preacher students and, and get some feedback? Then we took it to local churches. We took it to Bible classes. I, I think uh, Joey Barkley, I, I, he took it to the Bible class he was teaching and he, he, he got feedback. And Matt Gibson and others, they said, Rob, here's what they're saying. Then we published it, Believe the Bible, and our goal was to make it like back to the Bible, simple, right? And with, the, with anticipating religious questions, in other words, anticipating the errors, anticipating the objections, bringing them to a point where the only possible answer is yes. I don't know if you've noticed that in Back to the Bible, but Back to the Bible is written where really the only possible answer is baptism and become a Christian, or you just quit. Right, there, is, there are no outs. And th that's what Believe the Bible does. So what I want to do is get you to open that up, and I want to walk you through what I would do with an unbeliever. So if I knock on the door of somebody and they say, well, I, I don't believe in God. So here's my response. Have you considered? I've asked you to write that down. If you've not written that response down, that will get you out of trouble nine out of ten times. Have you considered? Don't get into an argument with, with them. Don't get into a back and forth. Just have you considered? Have you considered the possibility that there might be a supreme power in the universe? You know what I found? Most atheists, I'm not talking about people, atheists would agree with that statement. Do you know why? Because they have no explanation. They just don't want to believe in the God of the Bible. The in his heart, there's no God. They don't want to believe in the God of the Bible because they are moral atheists. Watch this. The fool has said in his heart, they're moral atheists. They don't want to believe in God because that means you have a higher standard. You have, it's more difficult it, to them. It, now, now they've got a conscience that's pricking them as they're walking through. They don't want to do that. So they're not just, it's very rare you find a, a, an atheist that has, has, has reasoned them to that point where they don't believe in any supreme higher power whatsoever. That is just rare. Most people are just either ignorant or they're moral atheists. Believe the Bible is designed to reach the ignorant and the moral atheist. Now, let me, let me make sure I, I present this correctly because this is important. We're laying the foundation. Believe the Bible is not designed for the professor in the philosophy department that has dug his feet in and he's trying to make some intellectual argument against God. It's not designed for them. It's designed for people who just don't know better. It's designed for people who just have never thought it through. It's designed for people who, who maybe um, uh, 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 have come to that decision because of a, of a, of a lifestyle they've chosen to live, and, and they don't want to believe in a moral lawgiver. So it's designed for the common folks. If you, if you run across an intellectual, and they, they, they're, they, they've you know, so-called reasoned it out, some philosophical uh, discussion, I'm not going to use believe the Bible. At that point, I'm going to go a little deeper into my toolbox, and I probably am going to pull out some of the more deeper theologic discussion, apologetics press, and get 
for literature, believe the Bible is not going to work. But the good news is that group of people is, is in the one percentile. You're talking about very small segment of society. Most non-believers are in the segment that says, I just don't know. Imagine how many people right now are growing up in homes and they don't know God. They've never been taught about the Lord. They, they, they've never been taught about the Bible. They don't, you know, when I grew up, most people knew if I used the word apostles, they could say Matthew, Mark, you know, Peter, Paul, James. They, they knew something about it. If you said Moses, they knew there's a Moses. If you said Genesis, oh, it's in the Bible. If you said, you, said, you know, uh, Thessalonians, that's in the Bible. There is, a, there is a growing group of people in this country that does not know that anymore. What are you going to do with those folks? Start with back to the Bible? No. Brother, back to the Bible is designed for someone who has some general knowledge of, of, of religion. They have a general understanding of God. So, so, so we've got to take people where they are at, not where we're at, where they're at. That's why that survey is so important. When I ask someone, hey, do you believe in the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Who? The Holy Spirit. No, no. What do you... You're talking about Jesus. I think I know something about Jesus. I mean, you know, if you're talking to somebody who has almost no knowledge at all, you don't start with back to the Bible, all right? Because they need to have at least a foundation to build on. Now, again, when you live in the South, when you live in Texas, when you live in Alabama, Georgia, when you live in the, in, in the South, most people are ready for back to the Bible. Now, if I lived up in Maine, I'm going to probably be using Believe the Bible a lot more. I'm just going to be honest. You would be. The further north you go, the northeast of our country, when you go up to California, when you go up to, to, to uh, you go over to New Zealand, you go to the European countries, more and more of those folks, they're not ready for back to the Bible because they don't believe in the Bible. That's why we call it believe the Bible. So we have to understand the foundation of Bible study is to take people where they're at. If you don't know where they're at, you cannot effectively teach them. Let's go ahead and open believe the Bible up. So what I want to do is kind of lay the groundwork with it, and we're going to look at a supplemental lesson. What does it mean, supplemental? It means it's designed to go with something else. This does not convert people. This is designed to get you to, does it matter, or back to the Bible, or open Bible study, or fishers of men. It's designed to get you there. Okay, so this study is a supplement, and it's written to get you to a point where you can do the Bible study. And we're always going to start with just a, we're going to start with a, um, with an introduction to gauge their teachability. I have a question for you. Is everyone teachable? No. Is every, is every door you knock a teachable moment? No. Does a person have to be willing to learn to be taught? Yes. Is, it, is, that, a, is that a reflection on you as a teacher? Is it a reflection on you? I know, uh, 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 brother, brother, um, brother Joe. I know you're a school teacher. You're, you're talking about teaching history. You and your wife. I don't know where she she went, but but there she is. Um, you're just smaller than he is. I can't see behind everybody. And um, is every student in your class teachable? Are there some that just don't want to be taught? And there's nothing really you can do. I mean, you know, you got to break through that barrier before they're ever going to 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 be taught. If a student refuses to be taught. Is that a reflection on you? No, it's not a reflection on you. So I want to I want to take that burden away from every Christian. Just because someone won't be taught does not mean you're inferior. It doesn't mean, well, man, if I knew what Rob knows, I could do it. No, that has nothing to do with it. You know, Jesus found unteachable people. There were people that he could not reach. They were unreachable people. Now that doesn't mean they're always going to be unreachable. Let the, doctor, let the doctor tell them they got cancer in three months to live, and we'll see how teachable they are. It's amazing, you know, all these profound atheists, how, how teachable they become on their deathbed. You know, and the statements they make, like Charles Darwin, Carl Sagan, and others on their deathbed, their deathbed statements, totally different from when, from when they were in the prime of life, aren't they? Complete opposites. So the windows of opportunity rise and fall all through life. So, so belief in a higher being should be the product of sound reasoning. We would ask for you to have an open mind, apply your reasoning abilities to some very simple questions, and draw some logical conclusions. It looks like some of our fonts are messed up, and so um, we'll have to, I might have to grab my book here in just a minute. 
Um, although you will find a few Bible verses, they are only used to state common sense principles. Now, this is, this is an important point. I've made a couple points already. M a lot of people who, who um, are in the, the, the unbelievers category, they look at Christians as being nonsensical. In other words, you're, you're just, you just, you know, I, I can't believe those, you know, they, they believe God's doing all these miracles and they get some feeling, they pass out. I mean, they look at you, they put you, they don't differentiate the member, the, the true Christian from anybody else. So you're with the holy rovers. See, that, that, that they put you in that category. So I want to, at the very beginning, I want them to understand, listen, I'm not, I, I'm not asking them to wait for Jesus to come down into their heart and be their personal savior and have some, you know, hallelujah moment. I'm not asking for that, all right? Because they may automatically think that's where you're at. They don't understand that you have reasoned to get to where you're at. Brother, we serve a reasonable God. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord, Colossians 1.18. Be not unwise, but understand the will of the Lord. Your God wants you to think. He's a thinking God. So I want to establish at the very beginning. But I also want them to do something else. So if you'll notice in Believe the Bible, and let's just look at a couple of these together. Go to the bottom of page two. There's a verse of Scripture. The teaching is not based from that verse of Scripture. They don't have to believe the Bible at all. But at the very beginning, what I'm going to do is start inserting the possibility that the Bible has some authenticity to it. That not everything in the Bible is a fairy tale. That there are things in the Bible that are true. It doesn't matter if you're a believer or a non-believer. You've you got to acknowledge it. That's why those verses are there. And I, want, I state that right up front. They're just common sense principles. That's what they are. Common sense principles. So let's notice um, what else it says. Um, who, our first subtitle, or who or what was in the beginning. So that we're going to, we're going to start as, as, as uh, far back from God as possible. We're going to go all the way back to the beginning. Question, do you believe the material world had a beginning? There is no... Although I, I want them to say um, yes, if they say no, it's not a killer. Someone called me recently and they said, Rob, what if they say no? What do you do there? Now, when you're in back to the Bible, the answer is solid because it comes right out of the Bible. It's hard to get it wrong. This is not the case. This is what makes this study a little bit more challenging because I literally cannot take them at this point to the Bible and say, that's the answer. I can't take them to a textbook because there is no inspired textbook for me to take them to. So I'm literally going to have to help a person get there by thinking and reasoning. Now, the answer obviously is yes. And even for most atheists, the answer is they know there has to be a beginning. That's just common sense. But there are going to be some individuals out there that are going to say, no, I don't think we had a beginning. Now, let's just stop and analyze that, that, um, that uh, statement. If you don't believe the earth had a beginning, what does that mean? Someone tell me, what does that mean? It's eternal. I want you to think about that. It's eternal. Do they really want to believe in something eternal? They're already in a box, aren't they? So, so am I going to let them answer? I'll let them put whatever answer they want. At this point, I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to argue anyway, but I'm not even, I'm, 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 I'm going to evaluate. I'm evaluating the student right here, all right? Now, the, the question is, is, is worded very carefully. Do you believe in the material world, material things, right? Material things. Do you believe the material world had a beginning? All right. I didn't ask if you just believe there's a beginning. The material world. Let's go to the next one. Next question. Do you believe the material world created itself from nothing? See how easy it is for you and I to answer these questions? But for an atheist, now they're sweating. They're having brain sweat. Because question number one already put them in a hole, and question number two, that's just about to the, the do them in. They do not want to answer these questions. These are the questions they stay away from, they run away from. These are the questions they write their doctoral thesis on, and it's 300 pages long, and they say nothing, because they do not have an answer for you. All right? Again, what is the correct answer? The correct answer is no. Do you believe the material world created itself? No, we don't believe it created itself from nothing. We know that, in fact, we know that nothing produces what? 
Nothing. We don't have a problem with that at all. They have a big problem with that. All right? They don't know how to answer that. Let's go to the next one. So, so notice it says, do you believe... Let's see if I can get it to advance here. All right? Do you believe it is possible that there was an energy in the beginning... Now, now look at how I phrase this. An energy that cannot be created or destroyed that could have been responsible for creating the world. Do you believe that's possible? Does anybody know why I put that in parentheses, by the way? Do you believe there was an energy? I put it in, an energy. I didn't say God. At this point, I don't expect them to believe in God. I just want to know, do they believe it's possible that there was some big energy out there somewhere that was responsible for creating the world? It's a, it's a basic principle of science. That's a scientific law. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. That's the law of thermodynamics. So either they're going to say yes and agree with you, or they're going to argue with themselves. I, I love this study because this entire study is going to be a test on their hypocrisy. Will they be consistent intellectually? We are very consistent, brethren, in what we believe. All right, we, have, we, we don't have to violate any laws of science. We don't have to, we don't have to, we don't have to um, contradict ourselves. Everything we believe is very consistent. The very doctrine or the very teaching of atheism is, is, is at its foundation is inconsistent, hypocritical, and self-contradictory. Let's go ahead to the next one. Would you be open to the possibility? Now, this is probably the most important question of this whole study. So if you want to mark this down, this is the most important question to the whole study right here. Would, would, would you be open to the possibility that this energy could, could be called God? Brethren, if they say no, there's very little you can do with this. I didn't ask them if they believed in God. I asked, would you be willing to entertain the idea that there could be a supreme energy, we could even call it God, who created... If someone's not willing to consider it, they're in the unteachable category. If you go to the door and say, would you be willing to sit down and study the Bible? And they say, no, they just became unteachable, right? That's what they're saying here. So at this point, this is what, whether or not I go forward or not. Brethren, I am not going to waste my time with unteachable people. It's taken me years to figure that out. See, when I was doing mission trips, when I first started, I loved to find that person who wanted to argue because, oh, yeah, you know, I've been prepared for this guy. Man, I, I got all the Greek. I'm ready. I got my syllogisms here. I, I'm, I got my debate notes. And, man, I'm going to get them. How many times do you think I got them? Never. You don't convert people like that. You know what you do? You waste time. Brethren, time is too precious to waste. There are a lot of people out there that are teachable. They do want to know, and I'm going to spend my time with them. I'm not going to waste my time with people who willing even, they're not even willing to think about it. So that question right now tells me whether or not I'm moving on. Now look at your verse. In the beginning, God created, I just, that this verse just happens to be there. They don't have to believe it's inspired. They don't have to accept it, but I want them to know that's what I believe. I believe in the possibility that there was a supreme being, an energy, whatever you want to call it. We don't have to call him Jehovah God at this point. We don't have to call him the God of Abraham at this point. But there was something out there. Now, let's go. Let's, let's keep moving forward. Now, a building requires a builder. These are deep concepts, so prepare yourselves. Here we go. Does every house have a builder? All right. So, again, here, here's a test of their reasonability. If they, does every house have a builder? If they say no, you're talking to someone unreasonable. So this, if they said no at this point, I said, well, explain yourself. To, and again, I'm the teacher. They're not the teacher. I ask the questions. Remember, he who asks the questions controls the study. Remember, that's the principle, defer, don't debate. I'll be in the, I'm going to be in the, the teacher mode, okay? Explain yourself. Tell me, how, how, how do you get there? I'm going to let them try to talk themselves through that. Because sometimes people just need to talk themselves through it, and eventually they're going to get to the right answer. Let's go to the next one. Isn't it, isn't it impossible for a house to build itself? Now, notice I phrased the question where I get a yes. You notice in back to the Bible, we like positive answers. So I always start, we always sort of phrase the answer where they're moving forward in a yes. I don't like no, 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 no. All right? I like yes, 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 yes. So, so I'm, I, I, all the questions are strategically asked. So notice, isn't it impossible for a house to build itself? Of course it's impossible. 
All right. Wouldn't it be equally absurd to suggest an infant could build a house? Yes. Now, why am I saying that? Because the builder has to be more powerful than the built. When you, look at a, when you look at a phone, you know something smarter than the phone designed it, right? Something dumber than the phone doesn't design the phone. When you, when, you look, when, you, when you look at a house, is your first thought, man, the ants did a good job with this one. No, the ants a builder, but it didn't build the house. You know, you know, you know it didn't build the house because the house is greater than the ant. The ant cannot build the house. The question is, isn't it impossible for a house to build itself? Yes. Wouldn't it be equally absurd to suggest an ant? In other words, whoever made this world has got to be greater than the world. They're already stuck. I mean, they are already stuck. Let's keep, they don't know it yet, <laughs> but why? So I just explained the answer, all right? Oh, by the way, let's go back. Can a house appear from nothing? No. Their answers must be consistent with page number two. So if they answered any of the questions on page two wrong, now you can, now you can look at page three and you can start seeing the inconsistency. So these are obvious. Can a house appear? No. Can the, can the world appear from nothing? A house can appear from nothing. Nothing produces nothing. Is it possible that a house has always existed? Could the house have always been here? In other words, is a house eternal? No, a house has not always been. So now we're talking about two different kinds of things. Things that are eternal, things that are temporal. This is, a, this is temporal stuff, right? It's, 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 um, it's bound by time. It's got a, it's, this has got a time clock on it. I don't know how long it is, but it's got a time clock. It, it, it had a point, an origin, and it's going to have an ending. All right, look at this next one. Must the builder of the house be greater in ability and power to the house? Yes. There, again, there's no other reasonable answer to these. Like if you're sitting across the table and the person's giving you unreasonable answers, that's an indication that that person is not teachable. So you can determine how far you carry it, but at some point you're just going to have to stop and say, you know what, um, uh, you know, you're not even being reasonable here, and, and, and uh, I don't understand why, and, and, and you start comparing their answers and see the contradictions from page two to three and from question to question, they're all over the map, and not everybody's teachable. But if they're, if they're the common person out here that just doesn't know, no, they didn't grow up in a house that was taught that there's a God, that Jesus... These answers are so simple. You're going to take them to a place where the only alternative is God exists. If a house requires a builder, is it possible that the universe would re possible? I didn't draw the conclusion. I just said, is it possible? I want to see if they're reasonable again. Is everybody with me so far? Any questions so far about what I've done? Is it simple? The simple, I, 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 we wanted to write material that did not require a class. Now, classes are always helpful, and I'm always willing to teach it, but I wanted you to be able to take this and just use it. You don't have to go to a preaching school. So I expect Rick Lawson and Scott Kane to know exactly how to do this. They were trained to do this stuff. But I want to put it where everybody else, I mean, from the youngest of ages to the oldest of ages, whether you have a high school diploma or you don't, I want to put it where everybody can get this. Hebrews 3, verse 4. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. That's the principle. Now, whether or not you believe in God or not, is that true? Do you have to believe in God to believe in that verse? So what are we doing? I'm introducing the concept that the Bible is a reasonable book. It's not a fairy tale. The Bible has scientific concepts in it that I don't care if you're a Christian or not a Christian. You got to, I mean, you got you to give it props. Say, yeah, that's right. That's right. Let's, let's go to the next. So every effect must have a sufficient cause. Let's go a little bit further. Is the existence of the universe greater than the existence of a house? Boy, we're going somewhere. It's going to be tough for him. This is going to be tough for him. Yes, of course it is. So if it's true for the house, I wonder if it's true for the universe. Here, to, do, you believe, do you believe that it would be impossible for the universe to create itself? Well, the answer would be, do you believe that it would be impossible for the universe to complete it? The universe create, it should be yes. That should be yes. Make a note of that. Jared, make a note of that. All right. Wouldn't it be impossible for the universe to have come from nothing? Yes. 
It would have been impossible for it to come from nothing. You, you could not, it, it, it's, it's not feasible at all. Wouldn't it be equally impossible for a man to have created the universe? Yes. I, who's going to argue out there that, yes, yeah, some man got, you know, some man out there, we're going to create, we can't create, brethren, we can't create anything. We, we're not going to create a universe for sure. Let's go to the next point. Must the builder of the universe come from outside the universe itself? Yes. In other words, the universe can't create itself. Something outside of it had to be the creator. Must the builder of the universe be greater in ability and power to the universe? Yes, it must be. All right. Must the builder of the universe be older than the universe? Yes. Well, I tell you what, they're in a corner here. The universe is not eternal. The creator of the universe must be greater than the universe. The universe couldn't create itself. The person, whoever, whatever created the universe has got to be, you know, exist before the universe, be greater than the universe. Does the fact we apply a date to the universe imply it had a beginning and therefore was not always existed? We do date the universe. Too. I mean, even atheists date the universe, whether it's, you know, five billion or whatever. No, they, it, it seems to grow by billions every year. I don't understand. The earth has grown tremendously more than I have in my lifetime. Um, they're always, every time they have a problem, they just give a few hundred million years more to the age of the earth. So, but the fact that they give a date to it tells us it had a beginning, right? They even, be, they even believe that. If it is not possible for material things like matter to be eternal, is it possible for non-material power like mind or spirit to be eternal? And there is the law. See, the first law of thermodynamics says energy cannot be created nor destroyed. So it's consistent with scientific law to believe what you and I believe. If we call that power God, is it possible that God could be eternal and also the builder of the, is it just possible? Once again, if they're not willing to entertain that possibility, you're talking to an unreasonable person. Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, the firm it shows his handiwork. The very fact that we're here says something was here before us. Any questions about this? All right, let's get going. Now we're going to go to the design. Every design must have a designer. So we're walking through reasonable. I'm not using words. Now, now if I was in a, phil a philosophy class, you know what I would have called what I just did? I'd call that the cosmological argument. I'd use big words, and I'd call it the teleological argument, the you know, ontological. I'd use big, I'm not using any big words. Simple concepts. So I keep it very simple. Wouldn't it be impossible for a camera to build itself? Yes. Anybody found a camera that's never been built? Can a camera appear from nothing? No. Does the existence of a camera demand that a camera came from something? Yes. Um, wouldn't the creation of a camera require someone superior and exterior as the creator? There must be a creator of... Yes. There must, does the camera demonstrate complex design? Yes. Is the camera complex? I mean, I, I grew up when I put film. I had to put film in camera when I was growing up. We don't do that anymore. And it was complex. But what we got now is even more complex than that. It's very complex. Wouldn't it be absurd to believe a camera could be created by an explosion in a factory? So we just had some random explosion, and all of a sudden, you know where we're going with this, right? All of a sudden, you got a camera. Well, that would be ridiculous. Now, that would never happen. I mean, if you tell me you just put a piece of dynamite in a parts factory, and you're going to get a camera, that is never going to happen. And they'd argue that. And uh, you, 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 they'd argue, how about if you did it a hundred times, you think you'd get a camera? How about a thousand times? Time doesn't allow it to happen, does it? So how about a million years, would that help? How about 500 million years? How about five billion years worth of explosions, you think you'd get your camera? Time doesn't solve every problem, does it? Is the human eye greater than the camera? Yes. If a camera requires a superior and exterior, exterior, that means outside of, superior above, would the human eye also require a superior and exterior creator? Uh-oh. Now I'm in trouble. Who wants to argue that the camera is greater than the human eye? Anybody want to try that one? Anybody willing to give up their eyes just to have a camera? Anybody willing to do that? I'm not. The camera is nothing more than a, 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 a human attempt to do something the eye does. 
Everybody understands with the camera, even though it takes just milliseconds to do it, it has to focus, right? Have you ever noticed how quick your eye focus? I'm, I'm looking all around the room and my eye is focusing here and, and far like that. A camera cannot do that. It goes, zzz, 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 right? I mean, you can have a Nikon, you can have whatever you want. You can have a fast lens, it doesn't matter. It takes it just a little bit to get, to get there. And in fact, with those big cameras, if you're, if you're, if you're wanting to get something far away, you gotta, you gotta swap out the lens, don't you? How often does your eye swap out a lens? It doesn't, does it? So you're trying to tell me what, what, what takes us, you know, computer labs, what takes us, you know, the best technology in the world to create, requires a creator, but your human eye, an explosion in a parts factory made it, or whatever, wherever they want to put it, but basically it's just a complete accident. Doesn't matter how much time there is. Let's go to the next one. So this is called summary, so we're trying to pull th some things together. All right, does a design require a designer? Yes. Does the universe demonstrate characteristics of design? Yes. Does the human body demonstrate characteristics of design? Yes. Therefore, would it be reasonable? Now, I'm not using the word possible. That's strategic. Now, we're reasoning. Now, I'm not in the throwing the die stage anymore. Now, I'm in the reasoning stage. Therefore, would it be reasonable to conclude the universe must have a designer? Absolutely. In fact, in Psalm 139, verse 14, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knoweth what. They don't have to believe that's inspired, but I just want to show them that the Bible believes our bodies are marvelously made. Let's keep going. Now, this is probably one of the strongest arguments. There's always a debate, but in my opinion, this is the strongest of the arguments we're going to make for God. So you're going to need to follow this really closely. And this requires a little understanding of history. You're going to have to understand a little bit about World War II to get this. Most people can get it right off the bat. If you have a question, you can stop me. It's all right. If you, if you haven't studied this, I, I take some of these things for granted because I grew up hearing this stuff all the time. So if you've never heard this stuff before, you just stop me and I'll explain it, okay? If a national law required you to exterminate all blonde-haired people, would that law be moral or immoral? Y'all answer the question. Y'all tell me. Immoral. Now, it's easy for you to say that, Derek. Why is it immoral for you? That's right. It's an easy question for you to answer. And you take that for granted. I mean, those are simple questions to answer does not want to answer that question. Let me repeat that. The atheist does not want to answer that question. In the Warren Flew debate, Anthony Flew did everything but disappear during the debate trying to avoid that question. If he could have put a bag over his head on national television, he would have done it. All the world was listening, and he would not answer questions like this. There's a reason they don't want to answer questions like this. They're stuck. They cannot talk about this subject. Let's keep going. If the law of the majority required you to exterminate all blonde-haired people, would that law be moral or immoral, everybody? Doesn't matter what the majority. So someone might, you know, someone might say, well, yeah, it would be immoral. Why? Well, most people would say that was wrong. Okay. Give it to them. Don't argue with them. They're going to fall in a hole. I don't argue with people. Remember, I just let them keep going. What does Bobby Bates do in Back to the Bible? Just let them keep going. They're going to eventually hit a wall. They have no place to go. Just let them answer. Again, a preacher called me last week. He said, Rob, they answered that question wrong. I said, let them. I said, just let them. Because eventually they're not going to have a choice. So, so let's go. If international law required you to exterminate all blonde-haired people, would that law be moral or immoral? How about if it's international law? How about if all the nations came together with a governing body and said, it's wrong to kill blonde-haired people, or it's right, excuse me, it's, it's, you should exterminate all blonde-haired people. Is that moral or immoral? What is it, everybody? It's immoral. It's complete, it doesn't matter what the international law says. All right, let's go to the next one. Is there a law 
that would protect all blonde-haired people from the majority national or international law? Is there anything out here that would keep all blonde-haired people from being exterminated? Anything? What law is it? Oh, it's easy for you to answer that, Howard. What law would you cite? You say, I cite the law of God. I would never exterminate blonde-haired people because that is murder and that's against the law of God. It's easy for you to answer that question. Try to be an atheist and answer that question. They don't have an answer. Wherever they go, it's, there's no answer. They're going to squirm. At this point, they may, if, if, if they know, there might be some that won't go any further with you because they realize right here, right here, the only alternative is God. And we're going to prove that See, now I've set the principle up, now I'm going to prove it with a real event in history. Now let's apply it. Did moral law require Nazis to disobey the German law to exterminate the Jews? Let's talk about that again. Now let's go back to World War II, and we have the, um, the Nazis. And they wanted to, they were going to exterminate the Jews. But was there a law, was there a moral law that would require the Nazis to disobey the German law to exterminate the Jews? Well, absolutely there was. Let's go back to that. I know it's hard to see that. I wish uh, we need to, I've got to set that PowerPoint up a little bit better um, so I don't have those font issues. So let me go to my book. Does moral law require a moral law giver? Well, there's only one answer to that. If you have a law, someone had to write the law. If there is, a, if there is a, a circumstance set up, someone has to give it. Now, let's go to the third. Wouldn't it be dangerous for moral law to come from one person? Oh, like Adolf Hitler. Everybody see where we're going with this? There's a big problem coming, and they're going to have to answer it. Wouldn't it be dangerous for moral law to come from like one nation? Like Ger- so if you, were a, if you were a German citizen living, say, in 1942... And Adolf Hitler is the dictator, and he writes the law. And the law says you must exterminate or take all Jews to this camp. Would it be moral or immoral for you to do it? It's immoral, but why? Because the law says you're supposed to do it. So what law are you going to use? You have... You have a big problem here. There's got to be a law that's greater than the national law, that supersedes the national law. There's got to be a something within us, something there. So let's just keep going and, and keep looking. Wouldn't it be dangerous for moral law to come from one nation? Okay, next question. Wouldn't it be dangerous for moral law to come from an international body? What about if the United Nations came together and said, you know, we're going to exterminate all... Oh, I think all Christians need to be taken to a re-education camp. Let's look at the next one. When Nazi leaders were convicted of violating moral law and sentenced to death, did they violate German law? Huh. Let's read that again. When Nazi leaders were convicted of violating moral law... And sentenced to death, because we did sentence Nazi leaders to death. Their officers, they were, they, were, they were given a death sentence. Did they violate German law? Did the Nazis violate German law? Yes or no? No, they were following German law. They were doing what their leader told them to do. So in the courtroom, a, a, a Nazi officer said, listen, I was just following my own nation's law. Everybody understand where I'm at here? Just keep following me. When Nazi leaders were convicted of violating moral law and sentenced to death, did they violate international law? Well, the problem is there was no international law. So you have to put down no. They didn't violate international law. There was no international law. Let's go a little bit further. All right. Go to page number 10 in your book. When Nazi leaders were convicted of violating moral laws and sentenced to death, did they violate U.S. law? Can, can you try another nation's citizens on your law? Is that right? Can that happen? No, you can't do that. It's wrong. So, so in a courtroom, you couldn't say to the Nazi, now they, that German over there violated U.S. law. Is that going to work in a courtroom? No. 
If, if, in fact, if you do that, you have just created a crisis in the world because now every nation is going to try you according to their law, even if you're not a citizen of that nation. So, so Israel is going to try you according to Israel law, and, you know, but I'm a U.S. citizen. You, you, can't, you can't come over here. You know, it doesn't work, does it? So let's keep going. By what law, here it is, when Nazi leaders were convicted of violating moral law and sentenced to death, we know they were, did they violate U.S. law? The answer is no. By what law did the Nuremberg trials convict the Nazis? So, if, does everybody, raise your hand, does everybody know what the Nuremberg trials are? Everybody know that? The Nuremberg trials were the trials of the Nazis after the war. So we were going to punish them. All those, all those, um, all the millions of Jews that were put in the gas chambers and did, you know, the horrible things they did, now they're going to trial, all right? So when, when you came into the courtroom in Great Britain or the United States, we had to cite a law you violated. The problem is, what law was it? Now let's look at note number one, Nazi Nuremberg trials. Note number one, on July 27, 1946, Sir Hartley Shawcross, chief prosecutor of the United Kingdom of Great Britain, asserted that the basis for human behavior, listen to the quote, Ultimately, the rights of men, made as all men are, made in the image of God, are fundamental. They had a big problem. There was no law in this world they could use to prosecute them. So what law did they cite? The law of God. That's powerful. That's a real-life example of what happens when you try to remove God. You can't do it. And so they appealed to they appeal to God as the, the lawgiver, and that's how we're going to try them. Now, let's go to the point number two. Now, we're going to go to the United States courts. So, in the Nuremberg trials, Chief Justice Robert Jackson said, as an international military tribunal, what they did, they're not, it rises above the provincial and the transient. I know those are kind of big words. Let me break them down. In other words, what they did, the law they broke, is, cannot be confined in a province. It's greater than any nation. The law they broke is greater than, it's not, it's, it's greater than the transient. It's above this world. It's above us. This is another way of saying they violated the law of God. There's no other way around it. Now, let's go to the, let's go to the um, page number uh, 11, summary questions. If God did not exist... Would objective, universally accepted, unchanging moral values exist? Would there be a moral value if there was no God? The answer is no. It wouldn't happen. Question number two. Do you believe objective moral values exist? Well, I do. You have to believe that. If you don't, you can't try the Nazis. If you don't, you can exterminate all blonde-haired people. All right. Next. Therefore, would you agree that God exists? That's a big question. Do you believe there has to be a God somewhere? Well, the United States Supreme Court said it did because they didn't have a choice. If they had a choice, believe you me, the courts wouldn't have used it. If they could find something else, they, in the Great Britain, they didn't have a choice. All right? Does evil exist? So let's just keep going. I want to carry this. So if they say, no, I don't believe in God, all right, let them get it wrong. Now they're buried. Does evil exist? Oh, yes, there's evil. Give me an example of something that's evil. Well, murder's evil, all right? Whatever it is, rape, evil, you know, whatever they put in there. Just let them put whatever they want in there, all right? What standard would you use to define evil? What are they going to say? What standard is there? Name me a standard out there that we've, all, we've already eliminated national law, international law, and the majority. We've already taken care of those three. They don't work. So what law are you going to use? Oh, well, just my law. But I don't have that law. Why, why is your law greater than my law? Are you telling me that you're more important than me? Because my law, doesn't, my law says it's all right. They have a big problem, don't they? There isn't an answer. All right. Does the existence of good require the existence of evil? Well, yes, the existence of good requires the existence of evil. What standard would you use to define goodness? Where, where's your standard for goodness? 
By the way, Jesus said, why do you call me? No one is good, but one that is God. Now, brethren, I believe that's probably the most powerful argument we make in this whole book, but you've got to think it through. You've got to understand how to use this. All right, so this is going to put them in a box that they cannot get out of. Let me see what time we got here. All right, I can finish this in about five minutes. We'll take a break. All right, here we go. Uh, this is a fun one. I like this one's fun. If a tiger that escapes from a zoo and slays a helpless child taken to prison and given a trial, anybody? Do we do that to tigers? No, we don't do that. Is a human who murders a helpless child taken to prison? Oh, yes. Do animals have morality? No. All right? So when the, the lion goes after the gazelle, have y'all seen the, you know, the national, you know, the, goes after the gazelle and gets the gazelle, does the, does the tiger have any guilt? It has none, right? All right. Do humans have morality? If humans have morality and animals do not, from where does morality come? Does an animal have a conscience? No. Does a human have a conscience? Yes. Does a lion feel remorse after killing its prey? No. It just licks it up. Does, do most humans, I said most, because I think there are some whose conscience has just been destroyed. Do most humans feel remorse after killing another human being? We do. We do. If a human has a conscience and an animal does not have one, where did the conscience come from? How do, how do, you, how do you evolve a conscience? If a conscience were the result of purely random chemical processes, could we trust it? No. If a conscience were designed and created by a moral lawgiver, could we trust it? Yes. In fact, in Romans 1 and 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, conscience, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. You can't explain it. The conscience is one of those things. They don't want to talk about that because they can't explain why we've got one and they don't. Let's keep going. Pain, suffering. Now I'm going to, I'm going to anticipate objections because they got objections. They got things they want to throw at out to you, so I'm not going to let them do it. I'm still in control of this study, and we're going to take care of it right now. Does pain serve as a warning device when you place your hand on a hot stove? Absolutely. What would happen to your hand if you place it on a hot stove and you could not feel pain? What would happen to your hand? You'd lose it. All right? Thank God for pain. Now, they're going to use pain as a reason there's no God. I just use pain to show you there is a God. And I thank God for pain all the time. Because without pain, I, I wouldn't be here. Look at this. When you place your hand on a hot stove, are you making a choice? Yes. And God allows you to do that. What would... Would your free will be removed if you were forced to keep your hand away from a hot stove? In other words, I'm asking, what other choice did God have? He has to let you make choices. And, and is, is pain sometimes a result of the choices we make? We blame that on God. All right, let's keep going. Is the law of gravity constant and dependable? Thank God it is. What would happen if the law of gravity were random? In other words, gravity kind of occurred when it wanted to. You know, and all of a sudden gravity just went away. Can you imagine what this world would look like? Can you imagine seeing Veronica float through the air? That would be, that got all of our attention. All right. What would happen if you chose to test the law of gravity by jumping off a cliff? You're going to die. If you decided to test the law of gravity and suffer from a fall, who's to blame? If you benefit from the law of gravity, who should you praise? You know, we wouldn't have an airplane if it wasn't for the law of gravity. We figured out how to use it to our advantage. I think I have one more there. James 1, 2, and 3, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces punishment, a requirement of God. Let's deal with another objection real quick. Does justice demand that a judge punish convicted criminals? Yes. If a convicted criminal is set free with no penalty, would the judge be just? No. Does punishment by a judge of a convicted criminal make the judge unloving? No. Can a judge be both just in his ruling and loving to all? Yes. If God is just, is he required to punish the guilty? Yes. Let me, let me put this out here. So you got, a, you, got a, you got a rapist out here, all right? And how about if the judge said this? Well, you know, we're just so loving. And uh, we're just going to... You know, don't do that again. And I know you've murdered a few people and you've, you know, you've done all that. But, you know, we're just too loving to convict because we don't want to be considered unloving. We're just going to set you free. Is that a just judge? 
Brethren, what we're trying to say is God doesn't have a choice. He doesn't have a choice because convicted criminals will be punished. It's not inconsistent with his law. It's consistent. If God did not punish those who are guilty, would he be just? No. Does the punishment of God of those who are guilty make God unloving? The answer should be no. The answer should be no. Can God be both just and loving to all? Yes, he can be. You can be just and you can be loving. Romans 15, 3, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. So now, we're at the end of the study. So we've laid out all this evidence. We've taken care of the objections, because that is the objection they use. I don't know another one. Here it is. Is it reasonable to believe if nothing existed in the beginning, that nothing would exist now? Yes. Is it reasonable to believe that the earth, with all of its complexities, came from nothing, or that it was created? Well, it had to be created. Is it reasonable to believe that the human body, with all of its complexities, is an accident, or that it was designed? It was designed. Is it reasonable to believe morality can exist without a moral lawgiver? No. That's not reasonable at all. Let's keep going. Is it reasonable to believe the existence of morality is due to the existence of a moral lawgiver? Yes. Is it reasonable to believe that pain is a warning device designed for our benefit? In fact, pain is good. Yes. Is it reasonable to believe that one can be just and punish evildoers without being unloving? Yes. Is it reasonable to believe one can be just and punish evildoers without being unloving? The answer is yes. Now. See here. Go to page number. Um, go to page number seventeen. You're in your book. Is it reasonable to believe in the existence of a supreme, eternal being? Is it reasonable to believe that? And that's the whole point of the study: to get the person to reason, to get them to accept the fact that it is not. It's not unscientific. It's not irrational for us to believe there is a supreme being. So we did this from a scientific standpoint. How many, did I take, did I, did I base any of this on the Bible? Or just common sense? Just common sense. All right, we're gonna take a break. Let's stretch your legs. We're gonna go do lesson B here in just a minute. Um, these are brand new PowerPoints, so there are a few things I've got to work out. Again, this is, these are new tools. And, um, and if you find a, a question that's confusing, and you can help me clarify it, bring it to me. If you find a way to reword something to make it easier to understand, tell me. Because we want to make this tool as effective as possible to reach out to people who don't believe. We'll be dismissed. Say again. Yeah, I think that's, it's a 16 by 9 on a 4 by 3 format. It is. It's a new power. It's a new PowerPoint. I haven't had time to adjust the, the to a form. Most 